Everybody should see my screen now. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and the invitation to give this talk about a very exciting topic, which is eCPR today and tomorrow. Uh, my name is Benedikt Schrager. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Hamburg in Germany, and these are my disclosures. So do we have to talk about the topic? So the main reasons, and this is something which I bet is obvious to everybody here, that the outcome of patients with cardiac arrest, and especially out of hospital cardiac, cardiac arrest, is quite poor with hospital survival rates, which are far below 30% for most countries. And the basic idea of eCPR is to use a VA ECMO in these patients. And I, as there was a talk about this before, I won't go into detail here, but the basic idea is that in those patients who have prolonged cardiac arrest, who are refractory to chest compressions and shock therapy, that in those patients, we use the VA ECMO to provide end organ and tissue perfusion until the native heart recovers and until we have a sufficient return of spontaneous circulation. And kind of one of the first studies which uh, discussed this topic and brought us up to attention was a trial which was published in Lancet 2008. This was observational data. Um, it was a propensity score matched study of roughly 60 versus 120 patients with eCPR and conventional CPR. And what the authors concluded was that no matter how long the interval between uh, cardiac arrest and VA ECMO implantation, the survival to discharge was always higher in the eCPR group. So again, retrospective data susceptible to, to bias, but a promising early finding. The only drawback of this study was that the neurologic outcome in both groups was comparable. So we had a better survival to discharge, but a comparable neurologic outcome. So as I first mentioned here, the neurologic outcome seems to be an Achilles heel for this approach. In the following years, this was then further developed. And in 2020, Yanopoulos published in Lancet the uh, findings from the arrest trial. This indeed was a randomized control trial comparing eCPR versus standard uh, chest compression or standard ACLS in patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest who had refractory ventricular fibrillation and no return of spontaneous circulation despite chest compression and shocks. And this is an important fact, who were estimated to arrive in the hospital uh, in less than 30 minutes, so who had an anticipated short time from beginning of cardiac arrest to ECMO. And this trial was indeed terminated early because the results were so abundantly clear that there was a survival of 50%, approximately 50% in the eCPR group, whereas all patients in the standard ACLS group have died after roughly three months. And this resulted in a relative risk reduction of 84%, which is quite impressive for this approach. We can say that today for eCPR, we can see, or we can consider this as an evidence-based treatment for patients with refractory cardiac arrest and especially out of hospital cardiac arrest. But as I told you earlier, there are some caveats with this approach. And the most obvious one is that although the ECMO can provide perfusion to the end organs and the tissue, it cannot restore what has been lost in the brain. So, and you can appreciate this in this chart here, um, the longer the no-flow interval and also the longer the low-flow interval, so no-flow would be the time from cardiac arrest to chest compression, and chest, uh, the low-flow interval would be from chest compressions to sufficient ROSC, and this also depends on who's doing the compressions. Is it the bystander or is it someone who has been educated in this? And these two times, these two intervals are very crucial in determining the neurologic outcome. So if if and always if we talk about eCPR, we have to make sure that we apply it to patients who have a chance that we try to improve all the other factors, to try to improve bystander CPR and quality of bystander CPR, because we can only then save a patient with an ECMO when the initial um, chest compressions and the initial uh, treatment has been so good that it, he has a chance to survive with a good neurological outcome. And the other caveat of the ECMO therapy um, is that it has a certain hemodynamic disadvantage if applied to a failing left ventricle. And here, here is something I've oftentimes seen 
is this is an ECMO for patient after 30 minutes of CPR, and you do see that the left ventricle works quite poorly, and this can either be a pre-existing condition, such as chronic heart failure, or this can be stunned myocardium. And the problem with adding an, ad, an ECMO to this patient is that we will inevitably increase the LV afterload. And I think this is nicely visualized in this um, video here. You do see the angiogram of a patient on VA ECMO. On the right side, you do see the nascala. And on the left, uh, on the bottom left, you see a pigtail in the aorta. And there we inject some contrast dye into the aorta. And you see that the retrograde flow of the uh, VA ECMO pushes the contrast dye up until the aortic arch. And there are the um, arrow marks the watershed phenomenon. So this kind of visualizes that the ECMO acts against the native output of the heart and thereby increases LV after load. And ultimately, this can lead to fatal complications. Be aware, not all patients are susceptible to that. Some patients do not uh, develop these problems, but it might occur in some. And as you might know, and I think this has been discussed also in previous talks, um, there, there's the suggestion to act on this increase in LV afterload by adding some form of LV unloading. And this can, for example, be an impeller, which is implanted into the LV, sucks blood out of the LV cavity, propels it into the aorta, thereby reduces the LV EDP, so the pressure within the left ventricle, and increases the cardiac output, thereby improves the perfusion of the myocardium through the coronaries. And I just want to guide you through the basic idea behind this. So imagine a patient in stable hemodynamics, you have a nice uh, blood pressure, you have a high, high amplitude and you have a low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So uh, PCWP as a surrogate for LVEDP, the pressure in the left ventricle. If this patient now transitions to cardiac arrest as is resuscitated, post CPR, we do have a failing left ventricle. And what you will see on the left that the blood pressure drops we have a lower amplitude, and but in exchange, we do have a higher pulmonary cavity wedge pressure because the LV is failing. It struggles to get the blood out of the heart, which increases the blood pressure within the heart. If you now add an ECMO to this patient, we solve one problem. We do increase the blood pressure. So the ECMO provides tissue and end organ perfusion, and you do see that by the elevated blood pressure. But at the same time, we do know that if we add the ECMO to a patient with a failing LV, we will further increase the LV EDP so we have a higher pressure within the heart. And the idea of LV unloading is now to add a device or a strategy which counteracts that. And if you add an impeller, you will see that you then have almost no change in blood pressure because you do not add this device to further increase the blood pressure, you rather minimize the amplitude. But what you do see that you reduce the watch pressure and you do lower the pressures within the heart. And at this point, I just want to mention, I will be talking about impeller for active LDL loading a lot because it's a very illustrative example, but there are other options to do so. You can add an IVP. You can also add a pigtail. You put a pigtail in the left ventricle and connect it to the uh, venous uh, circuit of the ECMO so that the blood is drawn from the right side of the heart and from the LV, then into the ECMO and then back into the artery. You can also add inotropes as a medical way of LV unloading, although this has some, also some caveats. And one thing you should definitely do is you should try to aim for a very low MAP target. So a mean arterial pressure about something like 50 to 55 millimeter mercury to take as much pressure off the LV as possible. And to prove that what I just told is actually right, we did a right heart cath in one of our shock patients. So not cardiac arrest, but cardiogenic shock. But I think it goes the same way. You do see on the left that in shock, this patient had a very high wedge pressure of about 40 millimeter mercury. We then initiated the ECMO, which immediately increased the pressure further. And then upon activation of the impeller, uh, we had a stepwise not as a the wedge pressure, which kind of proves that at least in this patient, the added LV unloading with an impeller in a patient on ECMO normalizes the intracardiac pressures. 
We have investigated this now in several studies. Uh, the most recent one was published in 2020, where again, this is observational data, propensity score match. So there could be, or there definitely is some bias in there. But in this study of more than 500 patients who are matched, we did see that the Agmela approach, so Impala on top of ECMO, was associated with a roughly 21% reduction in the relative risk of mortality. However, and this is the big caveat of this approach, this came at the cost of more complications. And to everybody working in this field, this is quite obvious. Always when you add a second device, you have a second bow vessel access, you have more chances for bleeding and ischemia. So this is something which needs to be taken into account if you apply this in your institution. If you do this, I mean, if you do ECMO alone, and the more if you do ECMO plus another device, you need to account for complications you need to have standardized protocols to optimize vessel puncture and all the management of both devices as much as possible. Because this is an issue you do, or you will see more complications and you need to try to prevent as many as possible. So where will we be with eCPR tomorrow? So in the first step today, we are at a place where we have evidence for this approach and we now need to improve it further. We do need to develop dedicated protocols to optimize eCPR, so to select the right patient for eCPR and uh, to only apply eCPR to those patients who have a chance to go out with a good neurologic outcome. And if we consider eCPR as a standard treatment for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, we also need to address the caveats of VA ECMO, which is a failing left ventricle post-CPR, uh, which might benefit from active LVR loading. Thank you very much for your attention.